When you think about it, without Easter, there would be no Christianity. Whatever it was that constituted the Easter experience, the obvious fact is there was enormous power in that moment. That power changed lives. Those early disciples went from being scared, running for their lives, they experienced something, something beyond themselves, and it changed them. They went out and boldly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ, even at the risk of being put to death, and in fact, most of them were put to death. The Easter experience redefined the way people thought about God. It created a new consciousness, and in time, it created a new holy day. Each of these changes points beyond itself to something that must be big enough to account for these possibilities. At the same time, this undeniable explosion of power does not lend itself to a particular explanation, and thus it forces us to acknowledge that whatever Easter was and is, we can approach it only inside the time and space vocabulary of those first century followers of Christ. For none of us can escape the limits of our own humanity. There is no verse in the New Testament that does not assume the reality of the Easter experience. Paul, the earliest New Testament author wrote his authentic epistles before any gospel was created. He describes Easter in this way. Jesus was raised from the dead in accordance with the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Note that in Paul's reference to the resurrection, he uses a passive verb, Paul does not say that Jesus rose, but rather that he was raised. The Easter action did not come out of Jesus himself. Rather, something outside of Jesus acted upon Jesus to raise him. Paul asserts he was raised by God. Into what? we might ask. Did God raise Jesus back into the physical life of our world, thus restoring him to the life he had possessed prior to the crucifixion? From everything that Paul says in other parts of his body of work, the answer is an emphatic no. In Romans, Paul indicates that this Jesus was raised from the dead and is at the right hand of God, Romans 8, verse 34. For Paul, the resurrection places Jesus at the right hand of God, not back into human history. Paul reinforces his understanding when he states earlier in Romans that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you and will give life to your mortal bodies. Romans 18, verse 11. There is a connection in Paul's mind between the spirit that raised Jesus and the spirit that will raise us and bind us to God in a new way. Another hint as to Paul's meaning is also found in Romans. Here Paul says, Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Romans chapter 6 verse 9. For Paul, the Easter event was a matter of being raised into a new dimension of life that he does not, and perhaps cannot, describe, but it is beyond the power of death ever to threaten or strike again. In the epistle to the Philippians, which was Paul's last authentic letter, the apostle speaks of Jesus as emptying himself. Was Paul not asserting that because Jesus had reached this new dimension of life, God had highly exalted him 
and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Philippians 2, 5 to 11. Jesus in the resurrection had entered into the oneness of God. This is clearly what Paul understood the Easter experience to be. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, it states, If you have been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. So the first step that those of us who wish to explore the meaning of resurrection must take is to recognize that the founding moment of the Christian story asserted that in some manner, God had raised Jesus into being a part of who God is. Jesus was raised by God into God. Christ, who was raised into God at his death, not into a life of flesh and blood in the world, nonetheless appeared to people. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8. The Greek word that had been translated appeared was optha, O-P-H-T-H-E. It is the same word used to refer to the God who appeared to Moses at the burning bush. It is also the word which we get the term ophthalmology, the science or study of seeing. Was the appearance of God to Moses in the burning bush an objective seeing? Is there a difference between sight and insight? What did Paul mean when he posted his list of those to whom the raised Christ appeared? Paul states that he appeared first to Peter. Now, in the Gospels, They talk about Mary Magdalene being the first person that Jesus appeared to. In any event, in the mind of Paul, it was Peter who was the first to see. The same would be true of Mary Magdalene. She was the first to see, the first to get it, the first to understand. Then Peter appears to have opened the eyes of the other members of the apostolic band so that they too could see. How did that happen? The language Paul uses seems to speak of a different kind of seeing from simply having a scene become visible before their eyes. It speaks of a breakthrough in their thinking leading to a new understanding. It speaks of putting things together that had never been put together before and thus firmed a new insight, a new perception of the living God and of reality. Was the resurrection of Jesus something like this? Did the tragedy that embraced the life of Jesus and led to his crucifixion get reinterpreted or understood in such a brand new way that it opened the doors to life never before imagined. There is a powerful story in the book of Genesis. The brothers of Joseph, who were terribly jealous of him, sell Joseph as a slave to a traveling band of people. The brothers tell their heartbroken father Jacob that Joseph was eaten by wild animals. However, Joseph, a slave in Egypt, eventually rises to become a ruler in Egypt, second only to the Pharaoh. When a famine came, Joseph's brothers traveled to Egypt in the hope of buying grain from Egypt's storage. While the brothers do not recognize Joseph, Joseph certainly recognizes them, And it is now Joseph who has the power of life and death over them. Would Joseph finally gain his revenge? Or 
would he absorb the pain of the rejection of his brothers and return to his brothers as an act of love? This was Joseph's choice. In this story, Joseph chooses to love them, and out of it, life was enhanced, both for Joseph and the lives of his brothers. This portrait of returning love for hatred was what the followers of Jesus saw lived out in him. Was Peter the first to see this? Was Mary Magdalene the one who always knew this? Was he the one who saw in the life of Jesus, driven not by survival, but by the love that enabled him to give his life away? Did this vision enable him to see God in a new way, not as the Almighty One or the judge of the world, but as the source of life, expanding the early Christians' understanding of what it means to be truly alive as the source of love, freeing them to love beyond their boundaries and prejudices and their fears without the expectation of gaining love in return, and as the ground of being, giving them the power and the courage to be all that they were capable of being, and in the process freeing and empowering others to be all that they could be. Was this the vision of God that they saw in Jesus, who called people to love on the highest level with no agendas? When he was victimized by those to whom he offered only love, when he died forgiving, loving, freeing, is this why they saw that God was in Jesus? Was resurrection the ability to see that Jesus had taken his humanity to a new and deeper dimension and had now stepped into the being of that which we call the living God? Was it a step from self-consciousness into universal consciousness, into an awareness of the oneness of all things. Is this how Peter's eyes were opened? Is this what Mary Magdalene always seemed to grasp? Was resurrection the power that transformed Paul from the one who said of himself, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? To the Paul, who when his eyes were opened, to the meaning of Jesus on that road to Damascus, could then say, Nothing in all creation can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Could this transforming experience be the essence of resurrection? For Paul and the other early Christians, and also for ourselves as well at Good Shepherd, Paul says, Jesus appeared. Resurrection was a moment of a new revelation that occurred when survival-driven humanity could transcend that limit and give itself away in love to others. The resurrection is not just one moment in time, it is this ongoing experience that we are called to recognize that is within ourselves and calls us to a new dimension, a transformation in being, a change of mind and heart. Jesus doesn't die on a cross and rise from the dead so that we could just go to church and have religion. Jesus dies on that cross and rises from the dead so that we live in Christ Jesus as brand new people who go out of ourselves and love in a brand new way. This experience is saying that God and human life can flow together. This is what it means for us on this Easter Sunday to say, yes, Jesus lives. 
Jesus is alive in me. Yes, I too have seen the Lord.